So today, we are starting a new sermon series. And uh, I'm actually kind of excited about it because it's about not having distractions. How many of y'all ever been distracted before? Distract. How many of y'all been that squirrel right there, right? You're doing something, something happens, and then next thing you know, you're over here. Have you ever cleaned house, and while you're cleaning house, you're doing this, and the next thing you know, you're doing that, and before you know it, you're doing this and then doing that, and then you forgot what you was doing in the original. You're like, no, I didn't even get this done, and this was, the, this was on the checklist. You've, y'all been there before? And so, and so we get so distracted, right? But could you imagine a world without uh, text messages? Can you imagine a world without messaging, without phone calls, without Wi-Fi, <laughs> without cell service? You'd have to get in your truck and drive down the road to actually go meet and talk. To, could y'all imagine a place like that? There is such a place in America, Green Bakes, West Virginia. If you need a place to go to, this is where you want to go. It's a quiet little town, about the size of Maryland. And, and it's, it's known because in this beautiful, nice countryside, looks like um, green forest to me a little bit, as I looked at some images on there. The reason why it's so quiet is because, show that next picture. See that big dish in the back? That thing right there is looking for E.T., okay? And E.T. talks real quietly. And so they have to have a radio quiet zone with no electrical in- interference whatsoever at all. And so you cannot even, I mean, they will, they, they have radio police that work, that work 24-7, 365, to make sure your Bluetooth is not on. I mean, it's that serious. They can find you if, they, if you're using wireless headphones. And so in this place is a place where there are no distractions whatsoever at all. How many of you guys would love to have a little verbo there, right? Just to go hang out where nobody can contact you. It's like a, a cone of silence. I, I, thought, I thought that was so cool. I was, I was looking into that. But I, there's also another place that's kind of like Green Banks, West Virginia, uh, where you can come and, and you can find uh, no interruptions, right? You can focus on the things that matters. And that is this sanctuary. And you know why you can do that? It's because we have some phenomenal workers in the nursery and pre-K area. You hear what I'm saying? Hey, no. You don't understand. I want you to understand. If they don't do their job, my job's meaningless, okay? I, I I can pray and study and fast and do all I want. But if you cannot hear what I'm saying because babies are just crying everywhere, then it all means nothing. So it's important that they do their job. But can I tell you that, that our nursery is expanding and uh, we need some help. And so I'm asking you this morning, in your pew, there are some cards there. You said, Pastor Scott, are you asking me to help out in the nursery? I don't know if I feel inspired. I don't know if the Lord's called me. I don't know. I'm not asking you for none of that stuff. I'm asking, can you? Can you, all right? Because what's important is, is that that job is a tedious job. But here's the thing is that those people back there provide us such a luxury of distraction-free. You can focus on the Lord. Most importantly, somebody can come into this sanctuary, hear gospel, and their life be changed because somebody was sacrificing. All I'm asking is some people to sacrifice along with them so we don't burn people out. So here's what I'm asking you this morning. On your card, there's different, um, different times you can sign up. What we're asking you is, is to serve no more than about eight times a year. That's about max, every, about every six weeks. And so about every eight times a year, if you'll get back there and sacrifice so somebody else can hear the message and be poured into, I would greatly appreciate it. And so would you this morning um, really ask yourself, and more importantly, if you and your spouse are needing some time to connect and work on your conflict resolution skills, Okay. <laughs> That's a great, listen, that's a great time, guys, to, to form your marriage right here, okay? So, uh, so you and your spouse, sign up. Say, we're back there, Pastor Scott. Whatever it takes to make sure people can be poured into and not burn out by being back there every single week so you can be poured into, right? We're family. We don't just like, 
leave Martha in the kitchen and be like, you know what, she's called to be back there. No, Martha needs some ministry time too. And so, so at the end of the service, we're going to take these up. But do me a favor, fill this out and um, put your name on there. Let me just talk about the reason for the series. We'll pray and then I'll let Destiny quit playing because she's like, Pastor Scott, when are you going to stop doing all this? I, I was praying. I said, Lord, what do you want me to talk about? What is it that you have on your heart? And I just kept hearing this word distracted, distracted, distracted. And I thought, okay, Lord, what does that mean? And what are you trying to say to us? And it simply it was this, is that he said, Scott, I need them to regain focus. I need them to regain focus. And so as we start this morning, I just want to ask you, what does that mean to you? What does that mean when the Lord says, I need to regain your focus? If the Lord spoke those words clearly to you specifically, what does that mean when he says, I want to regain your focus? What does that mean? How does that apply to you? And so when I look at that, there's um, no better way that I know to start in probably in the book of Nehemiah. We're going to start just one chapter. I'm not going to preach the whole book like we were last, uh, last year. But I want, to, I want to ask the Lord just to, to come in right now and just say, Lord, open my eyes, open my ears. Allow me to see and hear and focus on the things that matter to you. Jesus, I ask you, Lord, this morning, be with us. Allow our hearts and our minds to focus on the things that matter. And Lord, I pray, God, that you would eliminate the clutter, the distraction of the enemy, of ourselves, and allow us to, to refocus on the things that matter the most, and that's you. And I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. <coughs> Excuse me. Please pardon me today. Um, man, I struggle with, I don't know if it's allergies or what, but it has been after me all week long, and I'm a bit stubborn. Um, if I preach, if I have to call it quick, y'all just be okay. Just give me a grace pass. Today. Do I have a grace pass today? Okay, good, good deal. Because I really don't want to ask somebody to preach. I'm just selfish like that, I guess, guys. But um, uh, I, I want to share. I want to share, you know. Uh, when Pastor Eddie was up here last week, I was like, no, I'm ready to share. I'm ready. It's my turn. It's my turn. At? And so, um, so here we are today. So when I think about prioritizing our focus and getting back to things that matter, there's one statement in Scripture I feel like just resonates that more than any other scripture, and that's Nehemiah. When he says in chapter 6, he says, I'm doing a great work, and I can't come down. You remember that? I'm doing a great work. Nehemiah is rebuilding the wall. I'll take you back to some history really fast. Nehemiah is rebuilding the wall. It's been torn down since the exile. He has the king's blessing to go and to restore and to rebuild. He's out there rebuilding the wall, and there's oppositions that's coming against him trying not for him to allow to rebuild the wall. They're trying to manipulate him and intimidate him and threaten his life and mock him. And, and, and so here he is. He's building this wall as best he can with all this opposition in his face. And he finally comes to chapter 6. And as we see chapter 6, there's some things that the enemy is trying to do. But namely, there's three things I want us to focus on today in terms of distraction because that's what they're trying to do. They're trying to distract him. They couldn't, they couldn't threaten him off the wall. They couldn't mock him off the wall. They couldn't intimidate him off the wall. And so now they're trying to distract him off the wall. And so I think the enemy does that to us. He, he changes tactics. We just came through spiritual warfare. And if the, if the enemy knows that you're guarded up and you're, you're ready to go, you have all your armor on, then, then what they do in the wartime a lot is to distract you. And so we want to pay attention to his schemes because I believe the enemy will do just that, right? He'll try to distract you in different ways. And so I want to talk about three different ways the enemy tries to distract us. And if you're taking notes really fast, they're through friendships, they're through slander, and they're through religion. And these are the three things we see in chapter 6 this morning. So read with me, Nehemiah chapter 6, verse 1 through 3. Now when Samballah and Tobiah and Geshem the Arab... And the rest of our enemies heard that I had built the wall and that there was no breach left in it, although up to that time I had not set up the doors and in the gates. Sambala and Geshem sent to me saying, come, come, and let us meet together. So polite, so nice, so formal. Let us meet together. Kefrim, Kefrim, Kefrim. I don't know how y'all say it up here in the Ozarks. Hekafurim. Uh, in the plain of Ono, <laughs> uh, 
but they intended to do me harm. He knew that right away. So before I start, I want to say, oh, let me finish this, the most important part. And I sent messages to them saying, I am doing a great work and I cannot come down. Why should the work stop and I leave it and come down to you? And so before I move on any further about being distracted, you have to know what you're being distracted from, right? So can I ask you a question? Do you know immediately, or do you have to think about it, what is your great work? What's your great work? Because if you don't know your great work, then the enemy has got you, right? He knows he can distract you. He can have you doing this and doing that. Matter of fact, that's what the enemy will do. He'll try to bring to you the good things. These are good works. These are good works, good works, good works. But so long as you're not doing the great work, he'll keep you busy with the good work. So what is your great work? What matters to you? You know, I, I can tell you all day, for me, it's very clear. My great work has nothing to do with ministry at all. It has everything to do with my front row. That's my great work, my wife and my three kids. That's my great work. Anybody can preach and fill this pulpit better than Scott Brandon or lead a church or do anything else, but nobody else can, can father my children, can love my wife like me. That's my greatest work. That's what the Lord has taught me and shown me through different ways and avenues. So I know that's my great work. Everything else that tries to compete with that great work, I have to filter through that. I have to make sure it's prioritized in line so that way my great work is not compromised. So what is your great work? How do you know what you're not being distracted from? Because the enemy intends to do you harm. That's, that's his goal. He may come to you and say, let's meet together. You know, come, let's meet together. But notice where he says meet together at. He says meet together in the plain of Ono. Y'all remember the, 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 the plain of Ono? Uh, ono was a place that you didn't want to go. Because Ono was a place of neutrality, but most important, Ono was a place not too far from where you were supposed to be. Have you ever been not too far from where you were supposed to be? but not where you're supposed to be. Does that make sense? I remember one time I was coming home. I was home before the lights went off, but I wasn't in, inside like I was supposed to be. I was right outside in the driveway. And I told mom, I said, Mom, I was right here, by the, I was right here in front of the house. And she said, that's not where you were supposed to be because out there I was getting in trouble, talking and, and, and uh, hanging out with this, this boy I was supposed to be hanging out with because uh, that's why she sent me two streets over. So, um, so sometimes you can, be, you can feel like you're doing the right thing because you're so close to the place that you're supposed to be. It feels like you're home. It feels like you're supposed to be there. But the problem is it's not where you're supposed to be. And in the plain of Ono is where, is where they were not supposed to be because it was a place of neutrality. It's where the enemy could devise his attack. So he couldn't go back to Jerusalem where they were building the wall because he had support there. He had defense there. He had structure there. But in the place of Ono, somebody say, oh, no. That's not where you're supposed to go. Oh, no. In the place of Ono, he left behind some things to go there. Let me give you three things he left behind this morning. He left behind accountability. He left behind standards. And he left behind practice. So why are those things important? You see, when our friendships cause us to leave behind accountability, we're distracted. Because for you and I to grow and continue to grow in Christ, hear me, Accountability is not optional. It's not optional. All of us need accountability, no matter what. As a matter of fact, I would say the more responsibility that you have, the more accountability you should have. And so why is accountability important? Well, the word says this is clear and succinct as possible. Proverbs 27, 17 says this. Iron sharpens iron, and woman sharpens another. When you and I get out of a stage of accountability, what we find is simply this, is that you become dull, you lose your edge, but most importantly, a place without accountability is always a place of anonymity and secrecy. And places of anonymity and secrecy are also called Las Vegas. And whatever you do in Las Vegas stays in Las Vegas, or so you think. And so we have this 
place in life where we're not home. People don't know us. You know, one of the most dangerous times in a person's life, season of life, is when they go to college and they're off to another state or they're away from the accountability structures because you guys know around here, if you do something wrong, you say something wrong, everybody going to know it, right? But when you go to college, nobody knows who you are. There's this freedom. There's this anonymity. That you can do and say, and nobody's going to judge you because nobody knows who you are. And, and, and in that independence, we find ourselves slipping. But most importantly, what we find ourselves is not just leaving behind accountability back home, but we also find ourselves losing standards, and our standards start to fall. In the plain of Ono is where you start to lose your standards. Can I tell you that your standards absolutely matter. When our friendships cause us to compromise our standards, you're distracted. Here's the reason why. Because Psalms 119.105 says that your word is a lamp to my feet and a light into my path. His word is his statutes. His word is his standard. His word is his law. His word is his precept. His word is his commandment. And so when God talks about these things, he's telling us what happens when we compromise on our standards. So when we abandon the standard, Psalms 119 is telling us this, you're losing your path. You lost your direction. Why? Because you compromise, you, you compromise the thing that navigates you well. You thought you were going due north, but you found yourself southwest because you lost the thing that was absolute. God's word is the only absolute you will ever encounter. And anything that will propose itself to be a truth, claim against it, is a lie. There's only one truth, and that's the word of God. And if we allow that to be compromised, we lose our direction. Psalms 19 also says this, the law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making the wise the simple, or making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. When we compromise our standards, our souls cannot be revived, but instead become heavy. The simple are no longer wise. Some of us need that. And the heart fails to rejoice, and our eyes are misled, and we are deceived. How is that happening? When you compromise your standards. And in the plain of Ono is where, where we, we go to meet our enemy. We seek friendship. We seek acceptance. Whatever it might have been. I don't know. Nehemiah could have been an insecure man, and he wanted to prove himself that he was second in command under King Darius back home, but here he was in the plain all by himself, and these people didn't know him. Maybe he wanted to go meet with them and establish himself. Maybe he could use them to help build the kingdom, but he simply knew this, I'm not supposed to go there. Because for me to go there, I have to come down off my great work, off my great calling. And that's what the enemy is trying to get us to do. He doesn't care about any other things. He doesn't care if you compromise your standard. He don't care if you compromise your accountability. All he wants to know is if you can abandon the great work that you have. And if he can get you to do those things and leave behind uh, the, the things that build us and, and, and maintain us like God's word. Deuteronomy 6-7 six, seven, six seven says this, And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house. And when you walk by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise, if we compromise our standards, if we walk away from the great work and do so compromise our standards, do you know we've left our children to face the future on their own? It is up to you. It is not up to me to teach your children. It's not up to the church to teach your children. It's up to the church to equip the saints to equip mom and dad. Mom and dad is the center of the family. And it is their responsibility to make sure that Mark and Johnny and Susie know what the word of the Lord says. That they may walk in it every day of their life. It has always been that way. It will always be that way. And it is the best way the Lord has built our society and our civilization about basing off the word. And here we see the same thing being repeated in Deuteronomy 6. And I command you today that you shall be on your heart. You shall teach them, mom and dad. You shall teach them diligently to your children. So when we walk away from our great work, 
We walk away from the standards that we have in life. And we allow other people to start teach our kids. And can I tell you, thank God for America, but the government longs to teach your kids. They want to teach your kids. They want to teach your kids more if you'll let them. And the plan is to teach your kids more eventually, but all the things that you don't want them to know. And so if you're not teaching them, then, then their cup is empty. You've allowed the enemy, the devil, to raise your children. It is up to us to make sure that we are their mentors. We are their disciples. We are their teachers. But not just accountability and not just standards, but Ono causes us also to leave our practices behind. So if he was to leave and go to the place of Ono, no longer is he anymore in the place where they celebrate Jewish festivals and, and, and feasts and, uh, and the rituals and the ceremonies. All those things the Lord gave, he gave a culture to the Jews. These things didn't exist. They didn't adopt these things from, from surrounding areas. He gave this culture to the Jews because he wanted through every single thing that they did is to teach them the character of God, the dependability of God, the plan of God, and the purpose of God for Israel's life. And so when we walk away from our great work, we walk away from the practices that we have. We walk away from the things that God has asked us to do, and that is read our word, pray, serve, give, come to church, you know, evangelize, mission. Those things are the things that the Lord has asked us to do because he is not only just teaching us his character, he's also asking us to demonstrate his character. But when we get into the place of own, that's a comfortable place. It's a place of accountability. We can be who we want to be. We can act like we want to act like. But we sacrifice all the things that the Lord has done in our life. And more importantly, we sacrifice our family while we're at it. And so we have to be careful that when the enemy comes with the invitation of friendship, who, who are you befriending that you, know, you should not be befriending this morning? Who are the people in your life that are causing you to be distracted? And I can tell you, if, if we'll just talk relationally just for a second. If you have friends, relationships in your life, and they cause you to compromise your accountability, to compromise your standards, and to compromise your practices, they are a distraction. And you may not agree with me on that, but I'm just going to make that a whole bold statement. If they're compromising any of those areas in your life, they are a distraction. They are a distraction. Now, can you witness to them? Yes, you can witness to them. But don't think for a second that they are your friends, that they should influence you. They are your outreach. They should not be your inreach. Make sure you understand the difference between the two. Because Jesus oftentimes, obviously, he, he ministered to many people. But those were not distractions to him. They were moments of um, discipleship um, that he poured into their life. Most importantly, when you walk away from the great work, we walk away from protection. Because the Lord has called us to a great work. And he's given all of us that we, given all the things that we need in order we can accomplish that great work. So when we walk away from the great work, we walk away, most importantly, from protection. The second part of this scripture is what we see here. Uh, Sam Ballot and Tobias come to him, and they begin to slander Nehemiah. It says in verse 5, In the same way Sam Ballot for the fifth time sent his servant to me with an open letter in his hand. It, is, it was written, It is reported among the nations. I love that. And Geshem also says it like he matters. That you and the Jew, Jews intend to rebel. That is why you are building this wall. And according to these reports, you wish to become their king. And you have also set up prophets to proclaim concerning you in Jerusalem. There is a king in Judah. And now the king will hear of these reports. So now come and let us take counsel together. And then I said to him saying, no such thing as you say have been done. For you are inventing them out of your own mind. That's polite for saying you're a liar. Y'all know just sometimes you gotta call people what they are. You're a liar. That's not right. For they all wanted to frighten us, thinking their hands will drop from the work and it will not be done. But now, oh God, strengthen my hands. When I read this, you know what struck me? Nehemiah is out here under the stewardship of the king. 
He's doing his best to maintain his integrity and his character with the king to let him know, I'm not out here on my own trying to build my own kingdom. I'm out here trying to do what the Lord has asked me to do. And I'm so thankful and gracious that you have allowed me to not just go and complete it and do it, but you've afforded me the resources. And so there is a heart of gratitude and respect and reverence that Nehemiah has for the king of, um, of Persia. And so knowing that makes me think about the accusation here. Because he says, you, you went and got you a rental prophet to proclaim that you're a king and that you have come to build your king in opposition. What will the nations say? And so when I read that, I thought, you know what, Nehemiah must have been thinking, you know what, that's everything I've been trying not to do. I've been trying to do my best. I went through great personal sacrifice. I've been great in my stewardship. I've been going back home and checking in like I'm supposed to. And this guy's going to make one accusation and ruin everything I've been trying to accomplish while I've been out here. Have you ever been misrepresented before? Have you ever been misrepresented? Sometimes, sometimes you, you just think, it, it, it's so overwhelming, you have no words. You're like, are you kidding me? I feel like all I've been trying to do is say the other way around, but it makes no difference because accusations don't need any kind of truth at all. Neither do the people who accuse you want the truth. They don't want you to argue. They don't want the facts. They want you to stop the great work. That's what they want you to do. That's the only thing that's going to satisfy them. And sometimes in our defense, we're trying to, we're trying to prove them, no, 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 that's not what I'm trying to do. Look what I've been trying to do. Look, A, B, C, D, see all these things? I've not said this. I've been doing this instead. I've given here. I've not taken there. Somehow I didn't care about any of those things because the enemy is trying to distract you from the great work. He doesn't care if it's true or if it's not true. You can't argue. You can't use information. You can't plead your, your case. And so I, as I was thinking about this, I thought, Lord, thankfully you're the one that defends us. Thankfully, you're the one that upholds our character. You're the one that goes before people and say, no, 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 Nehemiah is my servant. He's done well. And so I started looking through scriptures to try to find that, and I couldn't find that. I thought, wait a minute, Lord. I know you, I know you defend us. But as I started looking through scripture, what I realized was is the Lord is not really worried about your reputation and your character and how people see it. He won't defend it always. The Lord cares more about the work. The Lord cares more about your calling than he does the representation of your character. Let me show you. Because, because that bothered me for a bit. When I, look at, when I look at Joseph, and he was accused, and we know that he was not in the wrong, but he got thrown in jail, right? Not only was Joseph, but then you had David, who was running for his life because, because he was accused by King Saul trying to take his life. And so he was on the run from King Saul for a period of time. And then you had Daniel, who was trying to serve, you know, a, a pagan king, but he was doing it in the best integrity that he could. And his contemporaries uh, knew that he was a prayer. And so they made this law up and tried to accuse him uh, as being dishonest and disloyal and not having integrity. He got thrown into the, the lion's den. You know that. And Jesus, they brought false witnesses against Jesus. And you know what it said of Jesus? It says he remained silent. I thought, Lord, I don't know. When you come after my character, I'm going to bow up every muscle I got. Because you work hard. Do you work hard for your character? Do you work hard for your name? You want people to respect you, right, and, 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 and take accountability for your word and know that your words matter. And so I know that Nehemiah was like, that's not it at all. That's not it at all. But when I go back through Scripture and I look at the word of God, here's what I see. The Lord didn't fend Joseph, David, or Daniel, or Jesus. Here's what, here's what the Lord did. He made sure in every one of those cases that the great work was accomplished. So can I say this morning to you, don't let slander sacrifice your calling in an effort to defend your character. Don't let, don't let slander sacrifice your calling in an effort to defend your character. Now, am I saying that the Lord will always allow your character to slot? No, no. It'll accomplish his purpose. 
It accomplishes his purpose. But our responsibility is to do the great work. That's why you got to know what you're called to do. What are you called to do? Because that's your purpose. That's why he knit you in your mother's womb. That's why he called you by name. That's why he brought you from where you, wherever you, that's why he gave you a testimony. So you could do the great work. So focus on the great work. Jesus says this, and in response to defending himself, well, let me just say this. Joseph, he didn't defend himself, but his great work was eventually he got to the second place in all of Egypt, right? And he, he ushered in uh, a peace and a time of restoration for the Jews to come in and build themselves until they actually got into some trouble, you know, because they turned their, their heart against God. But the Lord exalted Joseph. In his time, he, he, he brought him out of the pit and made him second in command. David became king, the most respected king in all of Israel. Daniel, after they threw him in the lion's pit, they yanked him out, realized that he wasn't, he wasn't the one in the wrong, threw the other people and their families into the pit. And then the king, the, the pagan king, said that the God of Daniel is the everlasting God. He is the living God, and he ought to be trembled and feared against or, uh, um, uh, before. And so, so what we see is the Lord continues to be faithful to the work. And aren't you glad that Jesus was faithful to the work? That he's he didn't, he, he could have said, do you know who I am? Matter of fact, if I go back to that place when they, when they accused him, they said, are you this? Are you that? Are you this? Well, if I back up to the garden when they came to, to, to seek him out and Judas gave him a kiss on the cheek and they said, are you the one we're looking for? Jesus said, I am. And the same I am was the same I am. And we see in Exodus when the Lord said, when, when Moses said, what's your name? He said, I am. And when Jesus said it in the garden, a whole congregation of Roman people fell on their butts. Sorry, their ears, all right? <laughs> fell on the power of God by proclaiming his name. But in the moment when he stood before the Sanhedrin, they said, are you, claim, are you who you claim to be? He remained silent because Jesus wasn't worried about his character, his reputation. He came to fulfill a call. And, and I'm so glad he did because 1 Peter 2, 23 tells me this. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. Mm, mm. You probably ain't weak like me. You probably ain't weak like me. It's hard for me not to revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, and he could have. He could have melted the hills like wax that night, but he didn't. But continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed for you were straying like sheep but now have returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. I'm so thankful that he did not try to defend his character but he went ahead and finished out his calling. Man, I'm so good. With that, I'm like, okay, Lord, I'm, 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 I'm on board. And notice what Nehemiah does. Nehemiah, he didn't say, oh, Lord, I've been working hard. I'm on this great work. Now defend my name. That's not what he said. He said, Lord, strengthen my hands. The enemy's trying to distract me. He's trying to instill fear in my life. Lord, they may talk about me. They may slander me. Because you know what's so powerful about slander? Slander creates that sideways, sideways energy, distracts you from focusing on the main thing. And Nehemiah said, don't let, them, don't let them distract me, Lord. But instead, strengthen my hands. Strengthen my hands for the work. The third way the enemy distracts us is through religion. The enemy is religion. Nehemiah 6, 10 through 14 says this. Now, when I went to the house of Shemaiah, the son of Deliah, son of Mehetavil, who was confined to his home, he said, let us meet together. There's those two words again, so palatable. In the house of God within the temple, let us close the doors of the temple, for they are coming to kill you. They are coming to kill you by night. But I said, should such a man as I run away, and what man such as I could go into the temple and live? I will not go in. And I understood and saw that God was, had not sent him, but he pronounced the prophecy against me because Tobiah and Sambalat had hired him. For this prophet he was hired, uh, for this purpose he was hired, that I should be afraid and act in a way 
and sin. And so they could give me a bad name because they couldn't really um, uh, pull out of one from me in order to taunt me. Remember, and this is the this is response. This is how you pray for, for uh, wicked men of God. Hopefully I'll never be one of those things. Remember to buy and send ballot. Oh, my God, according to these things that they did. And also the prophetess of Noadiah and the rest of the prophets who wanted to make me afraid. Here's what we see. Shemaiah was supposed to be a prophet. He said he had pronounced the prophecy. It was true during Nehemiah's day, just as it is in our day, that just because you have an office doesn't mean you have a job. And so here we had this wicked prophet who was trying to be a prophet of God, but his words didn't mean anything. He was a fake prophet. And so he was trying to offer some wisdom because he, he, act, he could speak the language. He sounded like he was a a godly man, right? He, he, he had the right words to say. He, he knew how to, 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 to mix wisdom and other things of speech together to, to, to proclaim a, 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 a mandate or maybe some recommendation, some wisdom to uh, Nehemiah. But really, it was a compromised form of religion. Only priests were allowed back in that time to actually go into the temple. And Nehemiah knew that he was not a priest. Matter of fact, I think it's in 2 Chronicles 26, King Uzziah, he went into the temple. And, and the Lord struck him with leprosy because he was a king and not a priest. Not anyone could go into the temple. But here this priest is trying to say, it's all right. The Lord ain't going to hold you up to it. Don't worry about it. Can I tell you that any religion... Any religion that minimizes the authority of God is a distraction. And I would say this, that a compromised religion is one that bears no consequence, no cross, and consequently no crown. There's so many teachings out there nowadays. We are in a, a, a vein of life, in a season of life, where many people would teach you the gospel. Or they'll teach you whatever they, the word of God, whatever they want to claim that to be. But there is a consistent thing that I hear. And the consistent thing that I hear is simply this, is that all of Scripture and all of God's work and all of God's ways, all these things were, were, were for man and centered around man for, for man's purpose and man's glory. Somehow we have taken the gospel and made it all about us. But it's a distraction that the enemy uses to appeal to our desire to look towards a man-made gospel where man is the focus and man's actions are the key to his salvation. This is not true because, because not only is it not true um, because the Word of God declares it to not be true, but we ought to be paying attention to that even to our day. Scripture warns us that right now that our religion is being watered down ever since the beginning of the last days, uh, which was uh, at Pentecost. Look at 2 Timothy 4, 3-4. It says, for the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching. But notice this. But having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions. It's what I need. It's what I want. It's what matters about me. And will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. Can I tell you that in Scripture, when you hear a prophet preach, no one liked the prophet. No one liked the prophet because the prophet was declaring things that did not make your life comfortable. In the plain of Ono was a place of comfort. In your life, we have places of compromise. We live in a culture and we live in a, in a country that is comfortable compared to the rest of the world. It is very easy for you and I to fall into the patterns and the routines of comfort, but we must never allow our religion to make us comfortable. You have not been called to comfort. You have been called to suffering. And if that is new to you, I would love to teach you that. Matter of fact, Scripture talks about how glorious it is that if we are going to be given in a resurrection like Christ, how much more wonderfully blessed are we to share in his suffering too? That if I get the same spirit that Christ has, then, then I found it a, a privilege to be counted to suffer like Christ. And you and I, we don't know what suffering is. We have no idea what that is. We may suffer somewhat relationally, maybe economically, maybe, maybe politically, maybe in terms of cultural pressure, maybe somebody slandering you. But we don't know what real persecution is. We don't know what real suffering is. The Lord has called us to suffer in different ways. 
And if someone's preaching a gospel to you, that's all about man's purpose and man's plan, man's peace, man's provision, then you're listening to someone who's preaching to you a compromised religion, and that's a distraction. It's not something that's bold-faced and different. You're probably not listening to some cult teacher, and I hope not. You know, but if you've got a question, come talk to me about that. We'll, we'll dig through that. You need to know what the Word of God is saying. And in fact, it's my heart that you go home once a week, sit down with your family, and say, let's see if Pastor Scott knows what he's talking about. Let's see if he's rightly dividing the Word of truth. I'm, I'm serious about that. It's what I'm preaching to you. Is it true? Is it right? Because I hope that in testing me, knowing my, what I'm saying is right, you will know the Word of God for yourself too. It's okay. And let me just say, you can question every pastor, question every teacher, discern. The Lord has given you a Holy Spirit so you might discern truth. And so just because someone has a place relationally in your heart, don't allow them to speak truth into your life if you're not validating their truth. Make sure you know what you know because we are in the time where we might have itching ears. We might be accumulating teachers to ourselves that fit our passions. Because we live in a time and a place of passion. How important is it for us to understand this? Religion that minimizes the authority of, the authority of God's words is a distraction. Because it, it goes all the way back to Genesis 3.1, right? Did God really say? That's, that's what distraction does. Distraction will help us, compromise religion will help us minimize the authority of God's word. Did God really say you can't eat of the tree laws of good and evil? Let me give you some statistics about how big this distraction is right now in terms of compromised religion, compromising the Word of God. As of 2022, 53% of Americans believe Scripture is not literally true. Not literally true. That's up 41% from 2014. With that, 56% say Jesus is the only, um, Jesus isn't the only way. 56% say Jesus isn't the only way. 73% believe Jesus was created by God. Please, if you have any questions about this, let me know. 60% of evangelicals believe the Holy Spirit is not a personal being. 57% believe humans aren't sinful by nature. Have you had children? 94% say sex outside of traditional marriage is a sin. Listen to me as, as destiny comes back. Sex outside of marriage is a sin. It's as much of a sin as homosexuality is. Sometimes we get off on these, on these, on these little pharisaical rants. Well, that's not, that's bad. But, but we embrace those things that are not good. In fact, Romans chapter 1, towards the very last, I think it's 31, 32, he says not only did they do them, but they, uh, but they condone other people for doing them. You and I, we, we, we don't get to walk this line, guys. We don't get to walk this line. The Lord is looking for a bride that is spotless and without a wrinkle. He is looking for you to walk, not the line, but to walk in the freedom of righteousness in his word. He's done everything that you ever needed to have done. All he's asking you to do is to love him, not follow his laws, but obey him. He says, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. And so we do those things, not because we want to be righteous and look right and condemn other people. No, I just want to love my Savior. I just want to let him know that I'll do anything he asks me to do, however hard it might be. I can't fulfill the all ten commandments of the law, but I know that Christ in me can. If I love him, if I allow him to work through me. And so we, we find ourselves in these positions of life that we have to ask the Lord, Lord, we need your strength. But give us discernment that we're not distracted by friendships we shouldn't have. By slander that, that preoccupies our mind and our character. By, by religion that is man-made and focuses on you instead of him. Distractions are many, guys. Prices are high. Stakes are high right now. My question is, is church, where are we at in all this? We're so easily distracted. Just stand with me this, this morning. I got two questions I want to ask. I'm going to open the altars in just a minute. The first one is simply this. Every head bowed, every eye closed. I just believe in my heart that the Lord was speaking to me this morning. And there's somebody here today 
that you've been living life distracted. You've been living life distracted. When I say distracted, I mean like you've not been following Christ at all. But you know you're supposed to. You know what's right, and you've not been doing it because you're distracted. The enemy has played his strategy on you. He's pulled you away. He's manipulated you. And today, I hear the Lord say to you, set your focus on me again. Set your focus on me. If that's you, will you raise your hand? Yes, yes. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Second thing is this. When I said great work, you struggled for a bit. You didn't know what that was in your life. But you want to know. You want to know. Or maybe you do know what that great work is, but you're having a hard time focusing on that great work. And today you say, Lord, I need you to strengthen my hands. Show me my great work and then strengthen my hands. If that's you, I'm going to open these altars. I'm going to join you this morning. Would you join me in praying? Oh, Lord, strengthen our hands once again. Show us how to get back to the wall, to not be distracted by the plans of the enemy. And help me fulfill my great calling. Would you join me this morning?